Welcome, you two. And especially welcome back to Whit Stillman. 14 years it's been since your, uh, your last film hit theaters. Thank do, you. Do you feel Thank like you. you've been away for that long? I like to say it's less time because we showed it last year. So I'd like to say 12 or 13 and fudge the numbers. First the numbers. Um, so I'm interested. You went to Harvard, correct? And you went to Columbia University? Barnard. No, Barnard. Barnard, okay. Yeah. Did I you? part of Columbia, but... Okay. Did you two know anybody like this while you went to college? Yeah, lots of people. Like, there was a DU fraternity at Harvard. They closed it. Oh, here tonight we have two um, brothers from our fraternity in the film. We have Brother uh, Story and Brother Angerman, I believe, sitting there. Hey. When, the, when you're doing the photo of the crowd, I noticed they didn't leave the room, which means there are no outstanding um, warrants for their arrest, <laughs> so, which is reassuring. And what about you, Greta? Um, there weren't particularly these kinds of girls. Uh, their concerns were not our concerns, but the, the, their essence, their souls, there were girls like that at Barnard. So, yes. Did you draw on those girls in order to portray Violet? Um, yes, although I, I think that my biggest influence was my high school boyfriend's grandmother. It's just like Violet. She's very particular, and she likes things to be just so. And she always used to tell me that I was crossing my legs wrong, and why didn't I look nicer? And it was, but she's one of my favorite people. She's got a really big heart. But um, I, I thought about her a lot while I was doing it. Yeah, this marks a really, really big departure for me. I remember, like, when I first saw the trailer for this film, I was really surprised to see you playing the kind of prototype mean girl, even though she's not a mean girl in the film. But you know, going into this, you wouldn't know that. Um, and also the the preppy nature of the part. Were you kind of surprised that you know Wit was interested in in, in you for this role? And uh, and Wit, if you could explain why you uh, sought out Greta for this part. Well, um, I don't, I mean, because Metropolitan came first, everyone sort of projects preppiness on everything we do, and I don't think that's necessarily the case. So um, the sort of spark plugs of this story are Violet and her friend Rose, and really in the story they're probably scholarship kids, but they just have a lot of style and a lot of opinions. Um, and I knew nothing about any of the actors who were cast in the film until very clever casting people said this woman or girl, do you want to be a woman or a girl, is a great, you know, great actress, and um, she's terrific, she's been a lot of things, and all I saw was her picture, and she's blonde knockout, so I thought she would be Lily, and so I met her at Pastis here in New York in the afternoon um, to have a nice tea or whatever, and we talked, and I found out that she was actually... Violet. I'm Violet. I was Violet. I, w I wanted to be Violet. You wanted to be Violet. Yeah, I mean, I... I I was, I've was i been a, a tremendous fan of Wits for a very long time, so I would have done any part that um, I had been cast in, but um, I, I loved Violet, and I, you know, I, I think I don't stereotype myself. I think other people do that for me. I mean, I don't, I know my, who I am or my range, and... Um, I, so I, I always wanted, I, I always knew that this was kind of part of it, this kind of me, more musical theater edge to it, um, because that's what I did growing up. I did a, lo a ton of musical theater. In high school, right? Oh, so much. And in college. In I, college. I did the, the varsity show at Columbia, which is like the big musical comedy extravaganza. And so it, it's always been a little odd that I was associated with like, hyper-naturalistic acting that was improv because I spent all of my high school years like singing Rodgers and Hammerstein <laughs> and totally overacting. Um, and hopefully I don't do it here, but, uh, but I've, I, this, is, this is actually in some ways much closer to who I am as a person than I think some of the things that people associate with me as a person. Not necessarily the character, but what your character does Not, not necessarily the character, but the aesthetic and the world and um, there's a certain glorious heightened absurdity to it that I think I, I actually I relate to and I, I feel like I live there more 
And back when you were said you yeah, you were a fan of Wit's work, I mean, you were what? You're you're 28 now, yeah. if I'm correct. Well, so you were 14 when his last film came out. Right. I didn't see the films in the theaters because I was too young, but I did um, I did see I remember seeing the preview for Last Days of Disco in in the art like the art house theater in my town. Um, and I remember always being interested by it and not knowing what it was about. And then I saw, eventually saw it and I loved it. And then um, I watched every all the other films and this was all right before college, around the beginning of college, and um, my friends and I tried to, always tried to dance, like Chloe Sevigny dances in Last Days of Disco, and she came to the premiere <laughs> of Damsels, and it was very exciting for me. Is that your first time meeting her? It was my first time meeting her. Really? Yeah. Um, Two indie queens meet. I, I guess so. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, love, I loved Wits... Wit's work, I and I, I was so thrilled that he was going to make another one. So much a part of your work is is your writing, your your writing voice. Um, I'm, I'm I'm curious about uh, the, the, for the part of Violet. I mean, you're giving these uh, these long speeches. You speak in this very very mannered, heightened way. Were you a little bit apprehensive, nervous about taking on a role that was so um, so well spoken, so? You couldn't depart from the script in any way, I, I guess. Was no, like this. I mean, uh, well, in Greenberg, we didn't depart from the script at all either, even though it's the language is very different and it sounds like it's naturalistic. It's actually not. And I, I, I really love a precise script. I really appreciate it. I'm, I mean, obviously, I've done a lot of improv and I find a lot of joy doing improv, but I think that, um, you know, sometimes... Sometimes it's lazy. Sometimes people use improv because they didn't write a good script <laughs> and they want you to come up with better jokes. But, um, ha- I mean, having great words to say is, is incredibly w- rare and a pleasure. It's, um, it's not like a, you, I, I didn't feel constrained or like, oh, if only I could improvise now. It's like, oh, thank God, these words are saving me. I don't even have to do anything. They're just funny. If, if, if this scene isn't working, it's because I'm doing too much because the, it just reads so well. So I'm curious, can you take me back to the first day on set? Um, just because you know you took such a long break in between your last film and this one. What was it like for you on the first day on set and what was it like for, for your actress as well? Well, I hope it's better for them. <laughs> it was really horrible. The best thing was that um, in the evening, our backers, Martin Schaefer and Liz Glatzer, at Castle Rock gave us a really nice uh, dinner party, which wrecked us for the next day. Um, but uh, I have a bad habit of, of um, losing assistant directors like within a couple of days of the start of a shoot. And I think Oscar Wilde said something about, um, you know, if you lose one parent, it's sad, but if you lose both parents, it's careless. And I've lost two assistant directors right before the start of a shoot, so I think I've been very careless with assistant directors. And it's a bit disorienting when the person who plans the whole production decides they have a tummy ache and their, uh, their tummy ache will not allow them to, to do the film. And um, fortunately, we got a um, terrific guy who is sort of expert as being on set to come in. And um, he was masterful on set, but he never really knew what the script was about or what was happening. And it was good because all the jokes refreshed him, so he would laugh a lot because he had no idea what was going on. But um, having three of us with no idea what was going on on set in the same day was, was, was difficult. <clears throat> Were you a bit nervous about working with a director who, you know, hadn't yeah. uh, been in the game for, for 14 years? Oh, no. I wasn't worried about him not having directed for 14 years because I think even if you work with a director who has, like, a very high output, yeah. they don't... It's been a long time since they've been on a set. Um, so, I mean, it usually has been more than a year. So I wasn't worried about that part of it. I mean, I was worried about my... I, we were all worried about ourselves. We were worried about our own performances. And um, I remember that the table read right before we started shooting did not go as well as I had wanted. I didn't feel good about it. And I was just terrified. I just I was so scared the first week. And then it settled into a groove, and um, it got better. Um, we, we had the event. I think some of the people planning the production had the good idea of not having a full week the first week. So I think we started on a Wednesday. 
and that's good because you get kind of a weekend to recover and get up to speed. Now, uh, I interviewed you uh, earlier this week for IndieWire, and we spoke about the kind of personal nature of the project. You wouldn't really know it um, going into it, but, you know, the character... Maybe of, I should deny that. Maybe yeah. that's revealing too much. Well, I, I don't think so. But the character of Violet, I mean, she undergoes this, this, this tailspin, is how she describes it. Um, can you talk a bit about the, um, you know, the personal connection to Violet, despite it being a female character, if you will? Well, not entirely. Um, maybe... Maybe it's more the, the girl Heather with bad morals that I identify with more strongly, actually. The bad morals? Yeah, the Heather, the, the sort of, who has sort of strange ideas about morality. Anyway, um, people haven't seen the film, so they don't know the reference. Uh, yeah, Violet I, I feel really close to, and it's very incongruous because I see her on screen and I have nothing to do with her except her sort of soul. I, I love Violet's soul. That soul is unfailingly upbeat. I mean, she's always positive no matter what. Even when she goes through this tumultuous period in her life, what was it like playing just somebody who's so, you know, has a sunny disposition on life? I think sometimes I would try to make it too emotional or I'd try to be a little bit too sad about things. And Wit would say, uh, no, don't, don't, you're not upset about this. Just, um, like, there's a scene where something she tries to launch a dance craze and it doesn't really work and anyways people say oh what happened Violet and she says another fiasco and I kept I did it the first couple of takes like another fiasco like we're sad and Wit said nope just say it cheerfully just say another fiasco and then <laughs> as soon as I said those things made it much easier like the playing against it. As soon as I saw what he wanted, it became easy because I was like, oh, I, I know what you mean. Because even though the, the rhythm of the language is written in the scripts, the characters r are often contradictory to the place that they're at, literally, if that makes sense. Um, like, they che Violet cheerfully has a tailspin, in a way. And, um, if there were such a thing. Right. And I, w I would say that her tailspin is not cheerful, but at that point, she's recovered from the tailspin right. so that a mere fiasco with right. the dance craze. But even when she's in a tailspin, in full tailspin mode at the diner, she's still very polite. But that's her, she's up, upbeat then. She's up because of the soap. Because we've had the good, <laughs> the funny, upbeat Adam Schlesinger score right. as she walks away. So <laughs> her mood's changed. Right. But she'd right. know that on set, that there's going to be Adam Schlesinger upbeat music. Oh, you did. Sorry. So now, um, going off of this, this dance craze, we have the choreographer here, correct? Yes, Justin Journey's here. Okay. Brilliant choreographer. So we're going to call upon his talents soon, but I think first we're going to take some questions from, uh, from the audience. So um, I think you just have to wait for a mic, or put your hand up, and we'll come to you with a mic. Anyone? You were saying something earlier, um, and you were talking sort of about, you know, how to say the line and not minding, you know, some comment on that. And one of the interesting things working with um, Castle Rock, where the backers of the film are, it's kind of Rob Reiner's um, company. And it stems out of them having worked together on This Is Spinal Tap. Because Rob Reiner was the director of that, and the business people at Castle Rock were the distributors. And they decided to make a company together. And Rob Reiner had a lot of sort of strong feelings that the prohibition, like the the, the idea that a director should be discouraged from kind of giving a line reading at some point or saying how you know, a word should be done or a line should be done, he felt that's really part of the writing process. So it's not insulting the actor. To, because some, sometimes dialogue, the joke is how you say it. And it's part of really the, the writer's brief rather than the actor's. And so it's not giving the actor a line reading. It's just explaining what the script is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I find... I, I don't mind line readings from director, I mean, especially if it's just like here's the jo here's how you say the joke, and it's less like it, it's less like you have to say it the way I say it, more like oh okay I understand where what the I understand how it works now. It's not. I can give you an example of why line readings are bad, because when I do something of that kind, I normally do it in an exaggerated, cartoonish way because I'm not an actor. I'm just going to give a sort of a little sketch of it, and. In one performance, um, the 
day player um, who just sort of pulled off our production crew <laughs> to do the thing, kept having their arms very stiff out in front of them. And I kept looking, why do they do that? All the editing process, saying, why are their arms that way? And then when we were doing the, um, editing the B-roll of the shoot, I see the director below them giving the lines, having his arms very stiff. And so I was giving the line, I didn't realize my arms are in a weird way. And so the person with the weird arm thing was just copying the idiotic direction I was giving them. <laughs> so be very careful. We have a question here in the second row. Yes. Oh. Hi, my name is Janice Rivera. Um, I just wanted to ask you both a question in reference to as far as your roles in the movie, you as an actress, you as a director, what kind of advice would you give for an aspiring artist slash actress such as myself in the city as far as pursuing their careers? Well, From your standpoint. well I think um, Greta would know the situation today better than me, but um, in, in my day when I was trying to start out, I did a comic mockumentary for public access, um, the East 50th Street story. Um, and we all thought it was hilarious. Uh, but that was in a way of just doing our stuff and having all our friends in it and having it funny. And, and, um, and I think now you can do that on the web and actually people can see it. And so a lot of people we seem to know seem to have come out of the world of their own webisodes. So Lena Dunham and Aubrey Plaza, I think, did their own webisode thing. So I think you can get together with your friends and just produce your own stuff, and if people like it, you've got an audience. Yeah, I, it's definitely um, making your own stuff and getting it online is, is a, a really, it's an amazing tool for people who are starting out. But I think it's also, um, I don't know if you're a writer, but I, I think it can often be hard for an actor because it can feel like I can't work unless somebody chooses me, which is always really frustrating. And um, I, I think that I haven't even I haven't done a bunch of this, but I know other people who have. Just in terms of like something to do, I know. I think improv classes are really great for you, and I think UCB is really great. And a lot of people start their own improv teams, and then it gives them a chance to perform, and it's self-generating. And I think sometimes, if you're unemployed as an actor and taking acting classes, it makes you crazy. And you're, and generally you're around a lot of other unemployed actors, and everybody's crazy. And there's something about improv class which is really great that it just kind of gets you out of your head, like you're not. It's, it, it prevents you from developing neuroses and it helps you in working with people and sometimes acting classes just make you more confused and then you feel like you're terrible at everything and then, it, I, I, don't, I mean, acting classes can be great. I don't mean to say they're not great, but I think that sometimes if you're struggling, it can be so much more fun to just get together with a bunch of people and like make up a play or do something because it, it makes it like playing and not like, this is hard and yeah. terrible. So I'd say that and just making your own stuff. And that's also a great way to meet people to make stuff. Because sometimes it's like, who am I going to make stuff with? And I think that's always a good place to find people, is my advice. Yeah. And you really got your start by collaborating with other people and kind of working your way up through the people that you, know, you worked yeah. with. Yeah. I, I, def I owe kind of everything to the people that I was working with um, what, right as I was graduating from college because they gave me a canvas. They, I was so lucky to meet them and they, you know, I didn't have a lot of... How did you get on the first one? Well, I was actually, uh, I met Joe Swanberg through um, someone I, well, he was from Chicago and I was dating a guy from Chicago and we met each other through that and... Um, so dating. 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 You gotta date a lot of people. No, but he actually, the guy I was dating was writing a fil film with Joe Swanberg and that film became LOL, which was a little film that we did together. And I wasn't in it, but he, my boyfriend at the time asked me if he could use voicemails that I had left him as found audio because he'd save them like a creep. And <laughs> no, he's not a creep, he's lovely. But, um, and I agreed. I sort of said, oh, all right, you know, that's fine. And then I ended up at South by Southwest in 2006, which was before I graduated college, and I met Ty West and the Duplass brothers and Joe, and it was, I was barely in this movie, but all of a sudden I was just around all these people who were 
in making things. And Aaron Katz was there, and it just was, and Rai Russo Young. It was kind of a magical year. And, um, and then I luckily didn't have a lot of financial needs. I was like living on, I was sharing a room and sleeping on an arrow bed, and so I could go make movies for free, and then I tutored um, for a living. I would say also don't get too good at any other job. <laughs> so you started out dating a writer. That's how, that was your path. Well, you know. So isn't that a Hollywood joke? <laughs> the actress who dates the writer, or something. Yeah. But the actress who dates the writer also usually isn't a writer herself. So. Right. I know. I've been accused of being a vampire many times. <laughs> right here in the third row. Hi, I'm Will Story. Hi, Wood. How you doing? Hi. Will is a funny part in the movie. He's <laughs> one of the DU brothers. Mm-hmm. Um, I just I was curious uh, where this story began for you. Like, uh, did you dream up the characters and think, oh, you know, this character Violet, I want to craft a story for this character, or did you? Were you interested in the in a in making a musical theater piece first? Or were you interested in the story and then sort of built characters to fit it, or? Well, there's a germ of an idea from something that happened um, after I was in university. I went back, and in my day, it had been very depressing and grungy <clears throat> and political. And they said, oh, there's this incredible group of girls, and they wear strong French perfume, and they dress up, and they give great parties, and you know, everyone's having a great social life. It's really so much fun. And so I started thinking about doing a group of girls. And this was a, a numerous group of girls, six or eight. <clears throat> and the first sort of low-budget decision is, just, no, there are only four of them. So you try to cut down the numbers. And um, so we started with the floral names. And I really like sort of dominant, larger-than-life characters. And so in a way, the Violet character comes out of the um, Chris Eigenman male characters in some of the films. Um, and the Kate Beckinsale character um, from Last Days of Disco. Um, but one thing I noticed is it's much, if this person is sort of intimidating and making all these comments that could be con- taken as critical, if they're also really nice and kind of generous and really trying to help people, um, it makes it a much more interesting dynamic. If they're just sort of mean girls, that's bad. But to have this person who seems kind of intimidating, but actually it's really sweet, and that makes it interesting. <clears throat> And then the music stuff came out of their obsessions, which happened to match a lot of my obsessions. So we got to shoot some musical numbers. And I'm sorry you weren't in the dance scenes, but, you, but we'll have more for you next time. Anyone else? Right here in the second row. So uh, judging from the trailer, there's, there seems to be a lot of deadpan just dialogue everywhere, and I apologize if I'm misreading that, but you sort of touched on it a little bit. I mean, just in general with this movie, but also just in general in films when there's movies that are really deadpan dialogue and that's sort of the style of humor, what kind of vibe does that create on set as opposed to something that's just outright like Animal House type goofy? Does that make well, sense? after the deadpan scenes, we have the Animal House scenes. Because these two guys here are our Animal House actors. They're, they're very thin for the John Belushi role. But, um, but I, I love Animal House. And I was actually was thinking of saying, when you're talking about you know, the preppy thing and all that, um, Greta's from Barnard, I'm from Harvard, and the actual guy who created Animal House, Doug Kenny, was from the most sort of rarefied world at Harvard, which is the Harvard Lampoon. So ultra preppy Harvard Lampoon, and he fantasized this idea of the American collegiate experience in like normal colleges and the normal fraternities, and and the, all that was kind of created out of the fevered imagination of a puny, who are the most Lampoon people are called punies, the most rarefied of rarefied people. So this sort of idea of sort of dumb college humor comes from this really unlikely source. But it's something very attractive, I think. It was so grim and political and unfunny where we were. We wanted to think that there are people taking road trips and doing all this cool stuff. Any other questions? <clears throat> Second row. You talked a little bit about the intimidating factor about being away from the set for so long. 
Are there any benefits from taking a break or kind of a refresher from that? If I give that impression, I'm going to take that back. I actually didn't find it all intimidating going back on set per se. It's just that particularly sometimes there are sort of crisis points in productions and things can seem <clears throat> really bad. And sometimes those things seem really bad and they stay really bad off and on for the whole shoot. But in our case, it just seemed like really bad for about 36 hours. And so, and really going back and doing it again, you know, it's bicycle riding or whatever. And I, I think that they say that the director is the only person on set who doesn't have to, who doesn't have to know how to do anything, even speak. And so, I mean, the cinematographer really has to be expert, and the assistant director really has to be efficient and organized, and the director can just be there, sort of la di da, what's going on? And you have to know your lines, and you know, everyone else is doing something tough. You're doing tough things, <laughs> Eva. And we, this um, production was aided by the fact that it was jet powered by Dunkin' Donuts coffee. <laughs> A lot of people think that there is a big product placement in it, but I think they gave us a card with enough credit on it to get two jugs of Joe, which we went through pretty quickly. What's the great joke about Dunkin' Donuts and the, uh, the Suicide Center again? <clears throat> there are just ever... so many great Dunkin' Donuts there jokes in the film. There's a donut joke. There's a donut joke. The donuts are only for the um, suicidal and seriously yeah. depressed. And then we take one back from a, yeah, a fraudulent you do. Person. So cruel, so cruel. You can't just say that your friend's depressed and get a donut. <laughs> you have to be depressed yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody else have a question? In the back. Uh, you guys both kind of came from this uh, ultra indie background. Um, and not, our boards sort not of... Not voluntarily. Not voluntarily. But you're both, you're both sort of moved into the limelight a little bit more. I was wondering what that transition was like, and uh, I don't know. Greta said the more dramatic transition, because you've done big budget. Yeah. Arthur and the like. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, uh, for me, it's been... A, I, I've, ex I've been just very lucky with all of it. I, I feel like I've been able to do bigger movies and then also do smaller movies. But I don't think that smaller movies are inherently better or big movies are inherently bad. I think that um, you know, great, great things can be done in lots of arenas. Um, I think that right now, because of the way that, you know, the way we can shoot for a lot less money and there's um, is shooting on HD and shooting the way we did on the red and um, I think it's exciting because I think there's a lot of opportunities for people to make movies, filmmakers to make movies for somewhat of a smaller budget than they had um, needed to raise before, which is which is fantastic. It means that there are more because it's you know even great filmmakers can't raise money to shoot some of the projects they want to, and you wouldn't believe it. You would be like, what? How could you not get money to make a movie? That's insane to me, and. Um, I don't know, for me, I'm just more excited about, about, about the direction that I think that movies are taking right now and the ability to make movies on a smaller level. Not because small is good, but because it's easier to just get done. Was there a difference between the two big budget movies you were in? But like between No Strings Attached and Arthur, was there a sort of a set feel difference? Well, in Arthur, there was... I needed to be pretty because he had to give up money for me <laughs> and in No Strings Attached I did not have to be pretty because I just had to be the best friend <laughs> not just money but Jennifer Garner yeah not just money you had to give up money and Jennifer Garner for me so there was a lot of concern from Warner Brothers <laughs> that I was not going to look right um, but I, yeah I, I, they, were, they were different I mean I think No Strings Attached was also even though it was a studio comedy it was written by one person Person. It was written by a very talented lady writer, Elizabeth Merriweather, who is also the producer and creator of the hit show on Fox, The New Girl. And she's a really funny writer. She's a playwright from New York who moved to L.A. and started making lots of hit things. Um, so that had a singular voice, which is, I think, unusual in a lot of studio movies because... 
on Arthur, there it there was a there was one script, but then there was tons of jokes pitched by other writers, and it was it went through this process where the script. Um, became multiple voices and it was up to the actors to kind of find the through line and um, and it, I, it's just a I, I'm always more comfortable with one voice because I have trouble figuring out tone if it's too many different kinds of jokes or too many different kinds of jokes written by different people I get I get a little confused in it but I think um, also the you know Russell was the the such a his rhythms and the way he does comedy was such a big part of it that um, that became the center of gravity for that movie was Russell more than anything else and Peter Bainham who's a wonderful writer who wrote the majority of the original script and he also wrote for Alan Partridge um, really wrote very well for Russell and um, and that was that was a centering thing but it was sort of the difference between it was like you know the, the, Sorry, I just got very distracted because I noticed one of my best friends <laughs> just showed up. Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, um, in any case, there was a difference, but now I just feel like I'm rambling. <laughs> any other questions? Anyone? We have time for two more questions, actually. First one right over here. Hi, wait, I have a question um, from an aspiring filmmaker. Uh, in a, in a way to avoid those crisis points that you were talking about during production stages, uh, what would you recommend? Any tips, any gold nuggets that you might have? I, I don't think that's the, that's the thing. You, I don't think you can... I don't think you can figure out how to avoid those kind of things. Just be, I guess just to be, be ready for it to happen and don't freak out and just move on and try to do the best you can. And we were incredibly lucky that the person hired to replace the first person was just the most brilliant person doing that in the business. And so we actually wouldn't have had access to someone of that caliber and quality if we were trying to get him for the whole big deal shoot. But we could say, you know, it's just these weeks and he wanted to take a week off and do something else he had to do. And so he said, okay, take that a week off. And so um, sometimes it's, it's sort of about flexibility that you don't have to do it the normal way with Metropolitan the production manager did not want to change his vacation plans over Christmas, and we plan to shoot a lot of the second unit stuff of the Christmas stuff happening. It's very important for the film. And in that case, I'm really glad I told him. I knew so little about filmmaking then. I said, oh, no problem, just go away. We'll do it ourselves. And it was John Thomas, the cinematographer, and me standing in the middle of the island in Park Avenue in front of the Waldorf Astoria filming debutantes and their extras going into a dance and then wait, coming back three hours later and wa photographing them coming out of the dance. And essentially it was John Thomas doing everything because all I could do was carry his camera case. Um, and, uh, and, and so I think it's just rolling with the punches, really. You don't know who's going to fail you. Someone's going to be a, be a problem. I think I've never worked on a movie, big budget or little budget. It doesn't matter. There's every every prediction has panicked moments. It, I never believe the film is going to happen until it's out. Like I, <laughs> like it really, even after it's finished shooting, I don't. But I, so Friday will be a happy day for you. It will be a if, happy day if, if everything goes. If everything goes. To if plan. everything goes well. <laughs> but I think it is like a, you kind of dive in and you're like. I hope we get through this, and it, but that's what, part of what makes it great. I mean, I've never worked on a newspaper, but I like to think it's similar. Like, we got to get the paper out. Um, it's kind of deadline driven, and um, you just got to get it done somehow. Unlike the screenwriting process, where you can take <laughs> several months or several decades. To <laughs> we have time for one more question. Second row. Hi. Uh, it seems that um, Violet is almost unaware of her meanness factor or that she's part of a mean girl's clique based on the trailers and clips. And I was wondering if, if she were to be told that that's what she is, would she be like, no, I think I'm just kind of, you know, proud of my honesty and aware of my bluntness factor versus, oh, I didn't think you felt that way about me type status. 
It actually well, comes up in the film. Yeah, it actually, um, I mean, one of the, the, the oddities about Violet and one of the things that makes it pure fantasy, as Whit likes to say, is that she loves criticism. She loves to be criticized. So she's always looking for people to tell her what's wrong with her. And she's very interested in it. And she says, I'd like to thank you for that chastisement. And she's, um, she has all these opinions, but she's ready to be wrong every time. And she's always looking for someone to tell her she's wrong. I mean, I think that in, in selling a film, there's kind of a reductionism. So I really like the trailer, I think it's really funny, but it kind of reduces things in a way, and then the clips do that too. So I think, you know, I love the trailer as far as, you know, pushing the film, but then I see it getting into reviews of people's expectations of what the film's gonna be based on the trailer, and the film's not exactly the trailer, therefore they might react in another way. It's kind of strange that all these things you do to sell the project sometimes come back to sort of harm the reception in a way. I hope that won't happen in this case. I feel like she described herself as more real versus mean. However, it would be like construed being like, no, I would expect anyone to you know, give me the same feedback. I think it's more in our heads, like we've seen mean girls and talked about mean girls, so therefore we see these girls presented that way, dressed that way, and we think they're mean girls, but they're not at all. And that's, that's, it's really our heads and our conditioning rather than what's there. Yeah, she's a very pure character despite the way she speaks. She's get totally pure of heart, and she really is trying to help people. All right, well, we want to thank everybody for coming out again. The film Damsels in Distress. We hope you guys had a great time tonight, and we can't wait to see you next time. Take care now. <laughs>